Okay. Good evening, everybody. Okay, so this um, this week's Torah reading, the parish as it's called, this week's Torah reading is the section which is called Chaye Sarah, which literally translated means the life of Sarah. Right at the beginning, the um, beginning of the section, um, it talks about how long Sarah lived. And uh, afterwards, it talks about uh, Abraham seeking out a burial place for her and then burying her and so on and so forth. Um, after that, he sends off his servant, Eliezer, to find a wife for his son, Isaac, for Yitzhak. But the first question we could ask, and it's a very reasonable question to ask, it would seem, is why is this section called Chaya Sarah? Why is it called the life of Sarah? It should be called the passing of Sarah. <laughs> not, not her life. And um, there are a number of different answers for that, uh, why that actually is. But suffice it to say that the passing of someone of the stature of Sarah, one focuses not on the passing, but on the life of the person. And we'll see a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Now, the, um, um, the first few verses then deal with her passing, or how old she was. And then um, Abraham is making every effort to buy the cave in Hebron, Hebron, where she is buried. In fact, this uh, weekend, this Shabbat, uh, is a very, very special one. Um, in Israel, it's kind of celebrated by a lot of people actually go to Hebron, to Hebron, on this week's um, anniversary or the 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 uh, the uh, telling of the story of the passing of uh, Sarah Abraham's wife and it's because it's called Shabbat Hebron the, uh, the the Sabbath in Hebron and in fact I have a daughter my one of my daughters and her family her husband and all of her kids uh, went there for this uh, weekend uh, they left this week and they'll be there for this weekend and it's, um, it's always a very inspiring and uplifting uh, occasion. But in any event, we could also ask the question, why is it that Abraham puts an inordinate amount of time and effort into buying a burial, this, this uh, cave um, where the patriarchs are buried, the patriarchs and matriarchs are buried? Why did he put so much effort into it? What was so special about that cave? about that burial area. And not only was it special to him, but he spent a fortune on actually acquiring it from Ephron. Um, why was this so important? One of the reasons that's brought is because that is where Adam and Eve are buried. So it's called Hebron because from the word, um, Chaver, um, or Chibur, Chaver meaning a friend, or Chibur meaning a partnership. In other words, it's the place where certain couples are buried. Abraham is buried there, with, uh, Adam is buried there with Eve. Sarah is buried there with Abraham. Yitzhak is buried there with Rivka, Rebecca, Isaac and Rebecca. And Jacob is buried there with Leah. Um, not with Rachel, Rachel. She was buried um, outside of uh, this area, which we'll discuss perhaps on a, an upcoming occasion why that is. But in any event, uh, there were what was so special about this place and why was it that Abraham made such a tremendous effort to bury her in this particular uh, place? 
there's also a an expression uh, in the uh, in these verses, which is um, it seems a very um, very unusual one. It says, "Vayakam Abraham al pnei meito." Abraham got up from literally from the face of his uh, of of his dead wife. That's uh, a literal uh, translation of it. If you want to have a not such um, literal translation, pnei meito means in the presence. He got up from the presence of his dead wife. Then he speaks to the uh, children of Chet, saying as follows. Now, <laughs> why, why am I choosing this theme? I just wanted to provide a, um, the Jewish perspective on the concept of death. Um, and perhaps uh, some of you will understand a contrast with uh, the day of uh, Halloween, which seems to be a celebration of death itself. And um, this is actually... Um, anathema to uh, the Jewish way of thinking. We don't celebrate death, we celebrate life. And that's one of the reasons that the whole section is called Chaye Sarah, the life of Sarah, not the death of Sarah. We don't, we commemorate death, yes, um, but we celebrate the life of the person rather than uh, mourn the death of the person. Of course, there's a period of mourning, there's a seven-day period of mourning. There's a thirty-day period of mourning. Very, the seven days is very intense. The thirty days is less intense, and then it goes on for eleven months. And all eleven months, altogether, uh, eleven months and uh, really twelve months almost, um, where there is uh, still a period of mourning. So we do mourn, but after the mourning is over. Uh, then starts the celebration of the person's life. So we have to understand as well why it uses this expression that Abraham got up literally from the face or from the presence, not literally, from, of, of his um, dead wife. Another expression here is that we have to understand is that it says that Abraham came to mourn Sarah and to weep for her. He came, where did he come from? So the uh, sages explain, and uh, this is brought down in the Zohar and various other places, and um, in Rashi, the famous commentator Rashi, that Abraham came from the almost sacrifice of Isaac. As we know in the previous week, which um, I wasn't here for, I was actually at a wedding. Uh, sorry, I was at a bar mitzvah last week, not a wedding. Um, so uh, last week, the uh, the main theme of the of the uh, Torah reading was the binding and almost offering up of Isaac. Now, as everybody knows, um, one of the things that um, Abraham fought against tooth and nail was the idea of human sacrifice, uh, which was very, very prevalent at that time and still, in fact, is prevalent even um, uh, right throughout the ages until really until modern times. And in certain, um, in certain places, it is still somewhat celebrated uh, or shall I say, um, I don't know if celebrate is the right word, but it's nevertheless um, a major part of some cultures. In fact, I'll tell you an interesting story. I have a, uh, um, I had a student actually, um, at that time he was, uh, he, was, he was a friend of mine, who was studying in the same uh, yeshiva, in the same seminary that I was studying in at that time. And at the same time that he was studying for his, uh, doing his rabbinical studies, he was also studying um, advertising and um, persuasion. <laughs> advertising and persuasion. Now, one of the things that he had to do as a work assignment was that he had to look over certain um, advertisements and find the hidden message in these advertisements. 
So he told me that one night he was sitting, he was sitting up late, he was studying, um, and there was a, um, an advertisement which was for Kalua. Kalua is the um, coffee liqueur, which I think comes from Mexico, if I'm not mistaken, and certainly South American. I believe it's Mexica, Mexican, but I'm not sure. In any event, um, it was supposed to be, I mean, traditionally, apparently, it's the drink of the Aztecs. The Aztecs, I believe. The Incas or the Aztecs. Okay. You probably see where this is going. In any event, um, he was studying this advertisement, and something really bothered him about it, but he couldn't figure out what the issue was. He couldn't figure out what the what this what the persuasion was, what the what the hook was, and why we, why it was such a powerful advertisement. So he fell asleep looking at it. He was very tiny. He fell asleep looking at this thing, and he suddenly woke up with a start and uh, with a feeling of tremendous fear, and he suddenly realized what it was sort of hidden in the clouds there was the, the scene was a scene of, uh, of, of of sort of cloud that looked like an idyllic sort of uh, pastoral kind of a scene with 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 fields and with clouds and it looked very like on the surface of it it looked very um calm and uh and and countrified and so on and so forth but hidden in the clouds um this was the way that they drew it was a picture of, uh, I guess it must have been a deity or something like that, with a dagger in his hand. And he was actually stabbing a sacrifice, a human sacrifice on the altar. Like that was what was behind the picture, but you had to look at it very, very carefully to be able to see it. Now, he showed me a few examples uh, of these things. And I was, you know, <laughs> I was personally shocked. I was really shocked. But they use airbrush and things like that, and it's a sort of a subliminal message. The subliminal message is, I suppose, power over other people, right? Almost divine power over other people. If you drink this drink, you'll have power over other people. In any event, there are um, uh, cults, even probably today, who kind of worship the idea of death. Uh, it was a music um, uh, a band called Grateful Dead, and uh, <laughs> and Halloween is again one of these pagan sort of things that was imported into modern uh, culture. That is kind of a celebration of death. I'm sure it's not a celebration of murder, but it's certainly a celebration of death, a concept of death. So, uh, in Jewish thought, uh, death is you know, not something that we celebrate. Yet, commemorated when necessary, but it's certainly not something to be celebrated. And certainly sacrifice, human sacrifice, is something that is absolutely anathema, hated by and rejected completely by, um, in, in, uh, in, uh, in Jewish thought and in Jewish practice in the Torah. And it was rejected by Abraham. That was one of the big arguments that he had with the, um, uh, with the various theologians and priests and so on and so forth of the area around where he lived was the argument against human sacrifice. All of a sudden, God comes along and tells him, take your son and offer him up on the altar, raise him up on the altar. And Abraham understands that he has to sacrifice his son. He goes to sacrifice his, uh, his, his child. And just at the last moment, the angel calls out to him and says, don't sacrifice him. Now I know that you fear God because you are willing to listen. You are willing to do and give up even that which is most precious to you. And that's what the whole story of the Arcada is all about. The story of the, the, the almost sacrifice of Isaac, uh, putting Isaac, the binding of Isaac, as it's usually called. Um, the story is uh, a story about how sometimes a person is called to, to give up everything. To give up everything. To give up even their own child for, uh, for God. Now, God does not want human sacrifice and he doesn't want um, uh, death. This was simply a test. And we all have to go through our tests about what it is that we're willing to give up. It is only someone like Abraham, and we'll see soon enough, Sarah, that are actually willing to give up the ultimate, to make the ultimate sacrifice, 
for the sake of their beliefs, for the sake of their, uh, their faith. Now, someone might be thinking, and uh, I understand the thought behind it, well, uh, is, isn't that what uh, happens in some uh, modern-day religions? They say that they're doing this for God, and then they kill people for that. So the difference here is that they're killing other people. Uh, here, in the case of Abraham and Isaac, because Isaac knew what was going on. He wasn't actually a child at the time. He was 37 years old. So he knew exactly what was going on. But both of them came to the conclusion that if this is what God wants, then, uh, then they're willing to go through with it. Now, um, immediately after this whole incident with the binding of Isaac comes the death of Sarah. And that's why it says, Vayavo Abraham. Abraham came. Where did he come from? He came from the binding of Isaac. The sages tell us that what happened at the binding of Isaac was that when Sarah heard that her son was actually, according to some, that he was sacrificed or that he was about to be sacrificed, her soul left her, that's how she died. And others say that when she heard that he was not sacrificed, she um, she her, her, her soul left her. Um, again, there's various explanations why her soul left her when he wasn't sacrificed. Some uh, some 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 uh, explain that she thought that maybe he wasn't worthy of what God and what it was that God would want, God wanted this uh, sacrifice. Or alternatively, she was just so joyful, and this is the more likely explanation. She was just so joyful that he hadn't actually been sacrificed, that, um, that uh, she, her joy was so intense that her soul left her and just simply didn't come back. Um, yes, Wendy, uh, that same type of advertising class in college, yes, hidden persuasion, subliminal seduction. Yep. A lot of it has to do with seduction, actually, sexual seduction, unfortunately. A lot of advertising is based on that. He showed me a few examples. Of quite stunning, actually. The mind sees things that we don't really realize. And then um, there was subliminal advertising at one point that was, ad that was banned because of, uh, because of its powerful effects. Uh, stories told, I don't know if it's legend or it really happened, but uh, they flashed this thing just before the break just before the intermission, before the interval, uh, in the middle of a movie, they flashed this, um, for one frame only, this picture of popcorn <laughs> onto the screen, and the popcorn sales went through the roof. And uh, was subsequently, you know, this went on for a while, and was subsequently banned because it was too powerful of a message. So the subliminal advertising things are very powerful indeed. In any event, um, to continue with the, uh, the idea, so Sarah, uh, passes away right at the time of the Akedah, at the time of the binding of Isaac. And that's where Abraham is coming from. Now, when it says that uh, Abraham got up from literally the face, literally the face of his, um, of his wife, so one of the commentaries, um, Rabbi um, Jonathan Eberschutz, in his work called Yarot Dvash, um, which is honeycombs, uh, he calls it honeycombs. He was a very interesting character. Uh, he wrote many, many very interesting, very, very interesting things. Um, but in any event, he, uh, he brings a um, concept from the Zohar that most people, uh, when they pass away, three things happen. Uh, when a person passes away, a person's face changes, face goes white, and drains of blood, and uh, the body starts immediately to uh, kind of disintegrate and starts to um, um, smell a little bit. And... Um, the light of their eyes disappears. 
the light of the eyes disappears. Now I've seen people passing away, and I can tell you that this in fact happens. However, with Sarah, that did not happen. It did not happen because we'll see shortly that she didn't die in the way nor most people die. Um, most people die um, and when the soul leaves the body, uh, it is sort of drawn out. Sarah died as one of the few people who died, the, what's called mitas neshikin, the kiss of death. The kiss of death. What's the kiss of death? So the sages explain that normally when the soul leaves the body, it's wrenched out of the body. It's a wrenching experience for the soul and for the body. However, with some very great uh, saintly people, with very saintly people, and uh, amongst these saintly people are Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, who were three spouses. Moses, Aaron, and Miriam also died by Mitat Nishikin with the kiss of death. And Sarah was another one who died with the kiss of death. That's why it says that when Abraham came and, he's, and, and he got up from the face of his wife, literally, not just from her presence, it means he saw that her face had not changed. Her face had not changed because she didn't die through the wrenching out of the soul from the body. She died by Mrs. Nashikin as if she was kissed by the divine presence and her soul left her. The sages in the Talmud, in Masech the Brachot, Brachos, say as follows, that when a person dies, the Misas Nashikin, with the kiss of death, it's like taking a hair out of milk. You can imagine that that's such a smooth and, and, and um, process that doesn't, you know, it's not a wrenching process, it's just as smooth as taking a hair out of milk. Um, so that was how Sarah actually passed away and that's why it says that he got up from the face he saw her face he saw the way her face looked and he realized that she had passed away by Mrs. Nashikin by the kiss of death and therefore if you have a look at the verse when it says uh, that Abraham came um uh, yeah, it says Veliv Kota. Veliv Kota is um, the cuff of that letter. Lispodla Sara Veliv Kota, the cuff of the word is a cuff, uh, the, the letter cuff, k in, um, um, in the verse, is a very small letter. Why? Because it says that he did not, he, he, didn't, he didn't cry much. He cried, yes, but he didn't cry much. Why? Because Abraham was a person who realized that life is a continuum. It starts before life in the body and continues after life in the body. There's life above in the Garden of Eden, so to speak, and then there's life down below in the body. And then there's life once again in the Garden of Eden. But on a higher level, hopefully. If one, if one played one's cards right, if one play, played one's cards right in this world, then it's a higher level after living in this world. And that's the whole purpose, actually, of living in this world, is to get to a higher level. In any event, um, the, um, the reason that um, the Zohar says that Abraham wanted to buy particularly this cave in Hebron is because the word Hebron, besides meaning couples, it means to bond with, right? He saw that her soul had bonded with God. And therefore, he understood that this was the right place to bury her. Now, let me um, go out on a little bit of a limb over here. I haven't seen this in, um, in, uh, in, in any works yet. I've been looking, but um, I, have a, I have a suspicion that I will find it somewhere else. But I think that the idea fits very, very well over here. We said before that the whole section prior to 
uh, this particular uh, we, this week's reading. The main thing that we spoke about there was the sacrifice, or the almost sacrifice, the offering up of Isaac. God never intended to have him sacrifice, and therefore he said, he never said, actually slaughter him. He said, raise him up there as an offering. Raise him up as an, as an offering doesn't mean necessarily slaughter him. Of course, that's what he wanted Abraham to understand, but that wasn't actually what he said. He just lift him up. Because Isaac's soul at the time of the Arcada also left him and went into the Garden of Eden. And there's a whole explanation in the Zohar. That's why there seem to be two years missing from Abraham's life, uh, from uh, Isaac's life, because that was the two years that his soul was in the Garden of Eden. Now, it could be that it wasn't two years necessarily in the Garden of Eden, but because time on a higher level, a higher spiritual level, is different from time down here, therefore it came out as two years over here, even though it might have only been for a very short while in the Garden of Eden. But I would like to suggest that Sarah's passing, passing when she heard about the Akeda was that she made an offer. Take my life instead of his. She didn't know that the intention wasn't for him to actually be sacrificed, but she asked for her life to be an exchange instead of that. Now there's a, um, um, there's a story, a very famous story actually amongst the uh, Lubavitch Hasidim about the daughter of um, the author of the Tanya. The author of the Tanya is Rabbi Shnei Zaman of Liadi. And Rabbi Shnei Zaman of Liadi was a, um, um, a disciple of the Magid Mizrich, who was a disciple of the Baal Shem Tov. He was one of the chief disciples of the Magid Mizrich, and all the other disciples recognized this as well, that he was perhaps the chief disciple of the Magid Mizrich. And he took over the um, uh, spread, the, 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 um, the mission of spreading the teachings of the Baal Shem Tov and the Magid Mizrich, which is called Hasidism, the Hasidic point of view, the Hasidic, Hasidic teachings in throughout the Jewish world, and particularly in, uh, in Russia, which at that time was a, a huge Jewish population. The majority of Jewish population probably lived in, uh, in Russia at that time, in Russia and in uh, Eastern Europe in general. In any event, uh, he took, upon, took it upon himself, and there were a lot of opponents, uh, amongst them the, uh, the Tsar, uh, who wanted actually to put this Rabbi Shnei Zalman, he was imprisoned, and he was going to be put to death for insurgency against the, um, the uh, Russian monarchy because he refused to um, accept that um, uh, various decrees against, um, against the Jewish faith and against Jewish study and so on and so forth and against many, there were many, many decrees at that, uh, at that time. And it looked like things were very, very bad. And um, one day, the daughter of Rabbi Shnei Zalman overheard him in a conversation. There was no one else in the room, but he was in a conversation, obviously, with the forces on high. And he said uh, in his conversation, um, look, it's possible for me to continue the work from up there but it is preferable preferable for me to do the work from down here but whatever the decision is that's what it will be in other words in 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 uh, in, um, in in simple uh, language he uh, understood that there was a death sentence and that he would be sentenced to death Immediately upon hearing this, this Devorah Leah, his daughter, convened together um, 10 of the great disciples, followers, Hasidim of the Alter Rebbe, and she swore them to secrecy, and she made them uh, take a, an oath that they would not reveal this to anybody, 
And she opened the ark. This was in the um, synagogue. She opened up the ark and she made an oath that she was going to be the tamura, the, the substitute for her father. She would be the substitute for her father so that her father should not pass away. And indeed, uh, shortly after this whole incident, um, shortly uh, right after uh, the holiday of Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the, the, the Jewish New Year, she passed away, leaving her uh, young son, whose name was Menachem Mendel, and then became to call the Tzemach Tzedek, who was then brought up by his grandfather. So she gave up her life for her father. My, um, I'm suggesting that the same thing happened with Sarah, except that she gave up her life for her son. Um, not her father, but her son. She gave up her life for her son. When her son's soul ascended to the Garden of Eden, it's very possible that it would never have come down again had it not been for Sarah's sacrifice, that she gave up the her life in this world in order that his life in this world could uh, continue because it was necessary. Uh, she was already 127 years old. It was necessary for someone much younger, obviously, to establish a family and continue the teachings from Abraham uh, and from her. And um, that is why later on in the section, I would suggest later on in the section when it says that um, when when um, when Isaac actually married Rebecca Rivka, then he brings her to uh, his mother's tent, and it says that uh, he brought her to um, his mother's tent. And the commentaries state, and she was, she was, she became Sarah. In other words, she became their life together was the life of Sarah that continued. So the whole concept, um, the whole concept, therefore, I'll, I'll uh, look at the comments in a second. Uh, the whole concept, therefore, is that we live on through what we leave behind in the world. When a person passes away, he leaves behind in the world all of the plantings that he has done and all of the, um, uh, the sowing and the planting and the reaping and so on and so forth. And that continues the life of the person. And therefore it says, for example, as uh, Jacob, it says, Yaakov Avinu lo mate. Jacob did not die. Why? Because it says, the fact that his children are alive means that he's alive because they lived on through him. Sorry, I forgot to take the phone out of here before we started. Okay. Um, okay, so basically the idea, therefore, that I'm suggesting in this, uh, in this um, one of the lessons that we can learn out of here, one of the important things that we can learn out of here is, first of all, that life is very, very precious. Every day that we live in this world is extremely precious. We have to learn to value it. And we also have to learn to, to sow, to sow seeds for tomorrow. There's a very interesting story in the Talmud about a person who was a very, very old man who was planting uh, a tree. And someone came up to him and said, uh, why are you planting a tree? It's going to take years before it bears, bears fruit. The kind of tree that takes a long time, seven years to bear fruit. So he said, I'm, uh, I'm not planting the tree for me. I'm planting it for the next generation. I'm planting it for my grandson. And that was, in fact, the case. So um, uh, when we plant our seeds now, the seed that we plant now is what is going to be, um, that's how we live on. So we have to plant good seeds. <laughs> we have to plant good trees. We have to plant the right seeds, not like sort of uh, dopey seeds, if you know what I mean but seeds which uh, learn to appreciate life, learn to appreciate others, learn to sacrifice for their children, just as we sacrifice for ours. Now, when I say sacrifice, I don't mean obviously human sacrifice, but simply things like um, sending your child to um, extra classes beyond what, um, 
uh, is given in school, if this is appropriate for that particular child, would be called a sacrifice. Making sure that your child lives a your child uh, lives a good life, uh, a moral life. Um, taking out, um, as we all do, um, you know, taking out loans so you can pay a mortgage so you can, your children can live in a, in a comfortable place, um, and so on and so forth. All these kinds of things are also called sacrifices. Uh, well, you know, um, and this is unfortunately one of the things that uh, youngsters today probably do not understand very well, that you have to sacrifice. Why? Because they got everything on a golden platter from their parents and don't understand, don't realize how much they've been given. And to a certain extent, just, uh, you know, have no understanding of what it is that, um, that the life of their parents built for them. So we have to instill this kind of idea in our children that what we give them is very precious. And we can do that by loving life itself sacrificing for our children, expressing our love for them, and that they too should learn to appreciate what they've been given. Most of the world uh, does not live the kind of life we live here in America. Um, the majority, the vast majority of the world lives a miserable, um, very tough existence, much better than it used to be, uh, even 50 years ago, much better than it used to be. But nevertheless, the majority of the world is still living a um, pretty miserable existence, fought with danger and with suffering and with... Uh, so we've got to learn to appreciate what it is that we have, focus on the good things. And that's what I think the whole concept of Chaya Sora, the life of Sarah, is coming to teach us. It's coming to teach us that every day is... Uh, every day in the life of a saintly person counts and every day in the life of a saintly person uh, counts not only for themselves but for the generations to come that's what we have to get out of it okay let me answer a few questions now um,